and welcome everybody to this webinar. We're going to talk about the intersection of dyslexia, reading disorders, and language disorders. I'll start us off and then my colleague, Dr. Anise Flowers, will take over. Before we begin, we want to tell you about the instructions for, for CEs. We're going to start out with the instructions for ASHA. If you would like Pearson to send to, if you would like Pearson to confirm your attendance to ASHA for this live event, we'd like you to complete and email the evaluation form. And Sherry mentioned where you can download that. Send email the evaluation form to Darlene Davis. And you can see Darlene's email right here. And it's also included in your handout. If you are viewing the webinar in the same room with other colleagues, also send the attendance form signed by each attendee. And email the documents no later than February 24th, 2021. And we will email um, your certificate after confirming your attendance for the full 120 minutes of the webinar. We'll submit the information to ASHA after confirming attendance um, for the full 120 minutes. Note that Pearson will not provide ASHA CEU participant forms for you to complete. We do not accept evaluation forms that are mailed or faxed, and we cannot submit partial credit for a course. You will, we will submit the information for your attendance at the live event, not for viewing the recording on pearsonclinical.com. And if you have questions about ASHA CEUs, contact Darlene Davis and her email address is here. There are also instructions for submitting forms for CPD or CE credits. The same information will apply. We will send you a certificate for CE or CPD credits. If you attend the entire 120 minutes of the live session, we will confirm the duration of your time online using or streamlined communications verification report. Again, you will not receive credit for viewing the recording posted on pearsonclinical.com. Please send in the evaluation form emailed to Darlene Davis no later than February 24th. Again, submit the attendance sheet only if there are more than um, one, if there is more than one person in attendance at your site. Again, no faxed evaluation forms and no partial credit is available, and the deadline date for submission is February 24th. Again, any questions, email darlene.k.davis at pearson.com. There are some disclosures that Dr. Flowers and I need to provide. We are the presenters and we are employed by Pearson Clinical Assessment. Those are financial disclosures. There are no non-financial disclosures at this time. In terms of the course content, Pearson Clinical Assessment is the publisher of the assessments that we reference during the presentation. I do want to say a few words about copyright protection. The materials in the presentation are protected by federal and international copyright laws. And as a qualified user, you're granted permission to use the materials for training only. They're not to be shared with any non-authorized user and are not for any other distribution. So to get us started in terms of what we'd like to accomplish um, by the end of our 120 minutes together today, we'd like you to be able to list at least two subtypes of reading disorders, including dyslexia. We'd like you to be able to describe the comorbidity of reading and language disorders and explain current trends and common methods of identification for reading disorders. So I wanna make sure that we cover the four broad areas um, that we would like to focus on. We're gonna start off with the identification of dyslexia reading disorders and language disorders. Then we're going to dig a little deeper into dyslexia, talking about a diagnostic model of dyslexia. And then we wanna talk about the role of the speech language pathologist in identifying dyslexia and reading disorder subtypes. We wanna talk about the role of the SLP in intervention, and we'll conclude with questions and answers.
So I'm going to get us started off thinking about the identification of dyslexia, reading disorders, and language disorders. And we'd just like to make sure that we're all using a common language when we get started here. So when we think about language, and each one of us here today started our language journey at the same place, right? We started our language journey with spoken language or oral language. And I'm going to use those two terms interchangeably, which, um, as most of you know, Asha does as well. So the best way to think about language, as we know, is as a code, right? We use this code, and what we do is we make specific symbols stand for something else. So we use this code and we use the code to represent ideas about the world. And the code has become conventional. Even though the signals or the symbols are arbitrary, the system has become conventional and we use it for communication. It's conventional because effectively we've all agreed on the codes that will stand for some real thing, some concept, some idea. So for example, if you think about in the English language, there is no reason why an animal with four legs and whiskers that meows is labeled a cat, right? Such an animal could easily be coded a uh, gato, and perhaps it is, now, I don't know, perhaps it is in a code system other than English. But although these symbols are arbitrary, the things to which they refer are mutually agreed upon. We have determined that in our English code, this code that is meaningful, we all will use the same language. So we all have decided that this representation that I have here, the code that we will assign to that representation, to that animal, is going to be cat, right? We've also decided that there are certain rules. We have all these codes. Um, I've decided that the code for this animal is gonna be cat. The code for that color that I'm seeing is going to be gray. And then what we need to do is make sure that new people entering our communities, so the little babies, when they enter our communities, we wanna make sure that they learn these codes as well. But these codes are all governed by rules. And effectively, in the English language, the word order, the cat is gray, is considered acceptable, right? It's considered correct. Whereas if I were to say the cat gray is, um, even maybe a two or three-year-old would tell me, that doesn't sound right. That violates the accepted rules, even though the words in each of these sentences are exactly the same. So when we think about language, spoken language, you're thinking about all of these verbal labels, if you will, th these codes that we have assigned to things, concepts, ideas within our communities, and then we combine the words in different ways in order to communicate. So you think about language and you think about language, certainly that spoken language, which is where um, language development starts. Virginia Berninger talks about the fact that we learn language first by ear and then by mouth. So when you think about language, you're thinking about two well, actually three modalities or, or two broad modalities on which we're going to focus here today, spoken, the oral language, as well as the written language. But there are also other modes of communication, right? So, for example, you may have the manual mode of communication, for example, American Sign Language. So when we think about language, language is used to communicate, which means I need to understand you when you are using language to communicate with me. So 
comprehension or receptive is an important component of language. And then I need to um, respond or use language to indicate to you that I understood the information that you were sharing. So when we think about language, whether we're thinking about spoken language or written language or manual language, you're thinking about a receptive component and you're thinking about an expressive component. So with spoken language, we often talk about the receptive component as being listening comprehension. And with written, comp with, with written language, we think about the understanding piece as being reading comprehension, understanding written language. And then when you think about American Sign Language, maybe the system is visual. The input phase is going to be visual. For expressive, the output phase, you're thinking about speaking when you think, when you think about spoken language the use of language or the production of language. And for writing, you are think in for written language, you're thinking about writing as the use of language or the production of language. And then if you're thinking about American Sign Language, you would think about the output as being gestural. So when you think about spoken, you think about the auditory as the receptive component, language by ear, and the oral as being language by mouth. For your written system, you're thinking about reading comprehension as being language by eye and the written component as being language by hand. So again, you're thinking about the receptive component and the expressive component, whether you're thinking about spoken language, written language, or um, another mode of communication like American Sign Language. So taking all of this, looking at spoken language as focused on receptive, listening and expressive speaking, written language focused on receptive reading and expressive writing. We want to think about how the different components of language actually impact spoken language and, and written language. And when you look at this graphic here that I got from Asha, Spoken Language Disorders, Language in Brief, you could see that whether you're thinking about spoken language or written language, you're thinking about these five language domains, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, and effectively, they all work together when we are listening, when we are speaking, when we are reading, when we are writing. So just to make sure that we level set and we're all speaking the same language as we go forward, when we think about phonology, we think about um, speech sounds, right? You're thinking about the phoneme, the phonemes and, and the sounds in the language and how you combine and use phonemes in order to make words. So when you think about phonological skills, phonological skills are important, um, especially when we're teaching written language and trying to build written language onto spoken language when we're trying to connect literacy to language. Effectively, phonology is important because those skills allow us to identify phonemes while listening. Think about that as phonological awareness. Um, ph phonological skills allow us to use phonological patterns appropriately when we're speaking, also to understand letter sound associations when we're reading, that would be phonics, and also when we're writing to spell words accurately. Morphology, when you think about morphology, the smallest units of, um, of, of a word that would communicate meaning, like the ed to make a, a verb past tense or the s to make a noun plural, you're thinking about how important morphological skills are because they allow us to understand morphemes when we're listening. They help us to understand grammar when we're reading. They help us to use morphemes correctly when we're speaking and to use grammar appropriately when writing. Similarly, syntax or the rules that govern how we combine words to make sentences in a language, those skills are important because they allow us to demonstrate understanding of sentence structure elements when we're listening and reading, and they also um, allow us to use correct sentence structure when we're speaking and writing. And then semantics. Semantics really go to the, the meaning when we think about the 
meaning of words, the combination of words. You're thinking about maybe words in a certain combination that would be more um, idiomatic expressions. But good word knowledge really allows us to understand the language that we hear and read and also allows us to use appropriate words and concepts when reading and writing. And then the fifth um, component, pragmatics, which um, refers to how we use language in conversation or in discourse, um, good pragmatic skills really are helpful when you're thinking about understanding conversational exchanges, thinking about how we understand social aspects of spoken language, how we use spoken, spoken language in social contexts. When you're reading, for example, how do you understand point of view? When you're writing, how do you convey point of view? So again, when you think about language, think about language in terms of the modality spoken and written, also in terms of the comprehension and the use, the listening and reading for the comprehension, the speaking and writing for the use, and then also how when we're thinking about listening, speaking, reading and writing, all five language domains are constantly at play, right? So, so all of this is important when you think about developing a good understanding of language. So when children enter school, theoretically preschool, or if they start in kindergarten, Effectively, they bring with them um, a knowledge of language. So they, they come in, they have learned the meanings of words, um, they, under, they can hear the way that they can hear sounds in words, they're able possibly to identify rhyming words, to generate rhyming words, alliteration, they can hear all that. And I'm saying all this, um, and let me just, just backtrack and put in a little caveat, right? Because of course we're saying that when children enter school, they bring with them a foundational um, level of knowledge with respect to, to spoken language, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, even though a lot of them are still making morphological errors, like maybe I eat it pizza yesterday or something like that. So but I also need to put another caveat in there because, of course, if you think about the work of Betty Hart and Todd Risley, who um, indicated with their study that not all children begin kindergarten or begin pre pre-kindergarten with the same level of knowledge of spoken language. So with that caveat, let's think that um, phonological awareness really is what will provide the foundation for the introduction of literacy. So when children are able to, um, to hear the syllables in spoken words, for example, um, bed ha is one syllable compared to bedroom, that's two syllables. They're able to identify the onset and the rise Rhyme in a syllable. In, in the syllable bed, the b would be the onset and the ed would be the rhyme. They're able to identify the sound units in spoken words. And what we do is we use that information because theoretically children are ready to read when they can identify and manipulate larger parts of spoken language, when they are aware of other aspects of sounds. So phonological awareness really is what will allow us to connect to graphemic awareness, which is the visual representation. So if I can hear the sounds in a word, for example, and I can hear b, e, d, then what I want to do is to associate with each sound that I'm hearing one of these graphemes or one of these symbols, and I want to put them together in a certain order in order to be able to read. So effectively, when phonological awareness is paired with the knowledge of letter names, the graphemic awareness, then we are introducing phonics, right? We're building on phonological awareness by adding yet what I call yet another code, which children have to learn to crack, and that is going to be the, the grapheme code. So when children encounter words, they do what um, Dr. Joseph describes as phonological recoding. So let's say you see the word dog. Effectively, what you want to do is recode that to its phonological 
um, counterpart, which is a word, hopefully, that you already have stored in your mental dictionary, which is the concept of dog. And you already know in your spoken language that this picture, this image, the code we've associated with that is dog. Now, some children, we want ultimately for them to see dog and say dog. So see dog, retrieve immediately the phonological code from your long-term memory, right? Okay, but some children can't make that connection right away. Some of them have to go through that intermediate step where they have to associate a, a sound with each symbol. So d, a, k, say it slowly and now say it fast. So segment and then blend. But effectively, the way that we connect written language to oral language is through this phonological recoding by seeing um, the graphemes and actually associating the graphemes in that order with um, with maybe a word that's part of our speaking vocabulary, or maybe we have to sound it out and then it clicks, oh, that's the word um, with which I'm familiar. So what's the relationship between language disorders, reading disorders, and dyslexia? Well, effectively, if you think about, about language disorders, language disorders, um, and I'll talk about our different definitions, but broadly, language disorders, definitely, if you think about language as spoken and written, language disorders can be a disorder of, of oral language or disorder of written language. Dis reading disorders would be a disorder of written language, which effectively would be a subset of language disorders. And dyslexia is a specific type of reading disorder, and that one would be a subset of reading disorders. So you see the relationship between these three. And if we think um, in terms of classifications and the way that we provide services, you think about oral language, the assessment of oral language typically completed by the speech language pathologist, and you look at our different um, categories, maybe a child is diagnosed with um, an oral language disorder, specifically an expressive language disorder. Maybe another would be um, classified with a receptive language disorder, and some might have a, a disorder in both expressive and receptive, a mixed expressive receptive language disorder. As I mentioned, some children would have difficulties with both oral and written language. And that would be the one over to the right, an oral and written language disorder. We often refer to that as OWL-LD. And again, if, if that is the case, then that should appear when you assess oral language. It should also appear when you assess written language. When you think about the typical disorders of written language, you're thinking often about um, word recognition, um, whether maybe you're struggling with the accuracy of word recognition, or you're struggling with the fluency of word recognition. It might also be that you're struggling with reading comprehension. So for written language and reading, either decoding or word recognition or comprehension, and then for written language, written spelling or written expression. So that's where we're going when we're thinking about dyslexia, when we're thinking about reading disorders. Now, one of the things that we wanted to tease out was comorbidity, right? When you think about language disorder, how a language disorder impacts achievement. In other words, do spoken language disorders co-occur when you with written language disorders, right? So we looked at some data, um, these data here from a special group study that we conducted during standardization of the Kaufman Test of Educational Achievement, the third edition. And I pulled out some of the information. We have a lot more information in the technical manual, but I wanted to show here that when you think about individuals who are diagnosed either with an expressive language disorder, a receptive language disorder, or a mixed receptive expressive language disorder. When you look at the means for that language disorder special group, 
you notice that compared to the means for the matched control group and the mean the match control group would be individuals the same number of individuals matched based on different demographic characteristics you notice that the means for the matched control group for oral language reading written language and math significantly higher among the matched control group and closer to the average range which is 100 right the mean score is going to be 100 and you notice the mean for the match control group close to that 100 and when you look at the means for the language disorder group notice that they're all in the low 80s so the language disorder mean for oral language 81.2 notice close for reading close for written language close for math what does that tell us? It suggests effectively that an individual with an oral language disorder or a weakness in oral language will struggle across curriculum areas, right? The other thing that we wanted to take a look at, well, what about the opposite? What if a student is classified with a learning disability in reading? Um, how is that child likely to perform on oral language? And so again, we looked at the data from a special group study, this one um, using the Wexler Individual Achievement Test, the fourth edition. And again, if you look at just the mean for the LD reading group, notice that for all of the reading composites, reading, decoding, basic reading, and reading fluency, you notice those standard scores are in the 70s, but notice oral language, 90, mathematics, 89.8, math fluency, 90.9. .9. Again, if a child is diagnosed with a learning disability in reading, it is possible that oral language is preserved, right? Versus when you think about a weakness in spoken language that tends to transfer across curriculum areas. Another study using the KTA-3, similar information, you could see, again, these were individuals who were diagnosed either with a learning disability in reading or with a combination learning disability in reading and writing. Again, for your reading components and for your written language component, notice the scores in the 70s, low 80s, compared to oral language and math, slightly higher. Again, when you think about oral language, about oral language, a weakness in oral language really does transfer um, to weaknesses across curriculum areas. Whereas if you think about a weakness in reading or writing, there might be other factors that might explain that weakness um, in reading and writing besides oral language. So we want to talk about why it might be that spoken language may be preserved in some cases of written language disorders, and Dr. Flowers will talk to us about that. Thank you, Gloria. So before we get into definitions of dyslexia and types of reading disorders, uh, I did want to build upon the foundation uh, that we've established so far about development and what does typical reading development look like so we have an understanding of where the strengths and weaknesses may lie in someone with a dyslexia profile. To begin, we're going to review the simple view of reading, which was first proposed by Gowan Tunmert back in 1986, and is really held as a very highly supported model of reading. The simple view of reading says the reading comprehension, which is the ultimate goal of reading, is really made up of two components, our word level reading or decoding skills and our linguistic or language comprehension. So reading comprehension requires decoding that you can recognize those written representation of words and that we use our language comprehension, our ability to construct meaning from spoken representations of language. And what I think is really interesting is obviously the language comprehension part of this formula involves our oral language skills, 
But even the decoding part of this equation, as we investigate further, you'll see that oral language skills, particularly vocabulary, it takes an integral role in the decoding part of the equation as well. And you might not have known you would see, you know, like a mathematical formula today in this webinar, but essentially if, if either decoding or language comprehension equals zero, just as in a, a, a multiplication sentence, then the reading comprehension would be zero as well. For example, a person might be able to decode Spanish, read the words accurately because of the very regular decoding and pronunciation rules, but not understand any of it if you don't have the, the language comprehension. And you could understand simple English have orally, but if you're only two or three years old and you don't know that printed code yet, you wouldn't be able to understand what you're reading as well uh, as well so we need both parts of the formula this model was expanded later by kim uh, into the direct and indirect effects model of reading which essentially said that in addition to these two components reading fluency acts as that bridge between our accurate word level reading and our language comprehension to produce the reading comprehension so here's an example of the simple view of reading. To read our words accurately and fluently, we will sometimes encounter in print words that we haven't never seen before, as well as words that we may be familiar with. So to understand the meaning of the text, of course, we need to understand the language. If someone were to read the sentence aloud to us, would we understand the language that they're using, what the sentence means. So that is a requirement. But then when it's in text, we also need to be able to read each word accurately. And while our oral language development is an innate biological process from the time of infancy, reading doesn't come naturally. This accurate word reading and printed text comprehension requires some systemic instruction. So first we need to be able to read our words, like read the word cat accurately, seeing the letters and understanding each letter matches a sound and then putting those sounds together to produce the word cat. And fluency develops as students are familiar with seeing the same words in print repeatedly and being able to recognize them quickly and easily. In addition to decoding all the words in the sentence, then we have to understand the text, what dogs and cats are. We need to know that a dog barks and that little and big are size concepts. So all that background knowledge helps with our comprehension. And we might have some world experience with dogs and cats and understand why a dog might bark at a cat even though it's the little dog here. <laughs> here we see the link between accuracy and fluency and meaning. So in this example, if a child just saw the letters but didn't know what sounds they represent, they wouldn't be able to uh, uh, gather any meaning from this sentence. Or maybe they can produce the sounds the letters make but it's very slow and very effortful, in which case you still might recognize the words, but, but the, the speed at which you were able to read was so slow, you, you couldn't grasp the overall meaning of the sentence. Now, if this child is able to put the individual sounds together easily to pronounce each word, and that leads us to fully grasping the meaning of the sentence. So the simple view of reading has two parts to the formula. The first part of the equation is our word level reading. And within that, you have to use your cipher knowledge and your word specific knowledge. So for cipher knowledge, we have the understanding of the alphabetic principle. The words are made out of letters and those letters represent sounds. And we have 
things like alphabetic understanding that left to right printing of a, a word represents the phonemes we hear in language from first to last, as well as you need your phonological and phonemic awareness that Gloria was talking about, all of the rhyming and blending and, and those phonological skills. So when you have that cipher knowledge, that's a pathway to being able to read the words individually or decode the words. Another way is having word-specific knowledge, so familiarity with words or word parts. So as children gain more experience with the words, they increase their sight word vocabulary knowledge or how many words they can instantly recognize as they're reading. So Dr. Virginia Berenger has a similar model regarding word-specific knowledge. Here we see word naming begins when the individual sees a word or the visual representation of the word. For example, the word dog. If you instantly say the word or immediately retrieve it, then you've connected the orthographic with the phonological, with the pronunciation of the word. And if you can also immediately connect that to the concept of what a dog is, that word is part of your sight word vocabulary, or as Dr. Berenger called it, your autonomous orthographic lexicon. So when we analyze the letters, sounds, and meaning, that allows us to form lexical orthographic representations in memory. For phonic decoding, we sound out unfamiliar words using our letter sound knowledge and our phonemic blending skills. And this method works well for reading both phonically regular words and also pseudo words. So in the example of cat, where you sound out each sound ka, at, and then you're able to blend that together. And this is a method of instruction that students are often taught in terms of being able to decode words, especially new words they encounter in text. Another method goes from grapheme um, to phoneme or orthographic mapping. Here we look at the mental process to store words for immediate effortless accessibility. And this is a primary mechanism for sight word learning. Um, and caveat here, the term sight word is often has multiple meanings. Sometimes it means high frequency words, phonetically regular words, or instantly recognizable. So when I talk about sight words here, I'm referring to what are the words that a, a, a child has as instantly recognizable. So orthographic mapping is how we turn an unfamiliar word into an instantly recognizable sight word. This requires your letter sound knowledge, your alphabetic principle, phonological awareness, blending, and oral vocabulary skills. So we all have large orthographic lexicons, maybe 20 to 70,000 words, but we weren't explicitly taught very many of those in school, maybe only two to 5,000 were taught in school. Um, so David Sher talks about how we actually teach ourselves most of the words we know as we're reading from one to four exposures after second grade, we're able to incorporate that new word into our sight word or orthographic lexicon. So here we're going from phoneme to grapheme. In this example of uh, learning a new word in print uh, with a dinosaur name. So you may be reading a text along and you come to this word and there's really more than one way. You could use your phonological skills to sound it out. You might try de nonichus or something, but... Perhaps you saw a video or a movie where you've heard of this dinosaur before in language. So when you get close with your approximation of it, you instantly recognize, oh, that's Deinonychus. 
but you say you knew about the dinosaur Deinonychus. You just never seen his name in print before. So here, what happens is you use, you did use your phonological skills, your phonemic proficiency and letter sound proficiency to sound out the word, but you actually, it's a uh, phoneme to grapheme because you used your oral language, your vocabulary skills to match to an oral word that you know. And what struggling readers often don't do this step of they'll sound something out and um, they're not able to always match that to an oral word. So when they come to it again, they have to decode it again and it hasn't become part of their sight word vocabulary. So this work, this orthographic mapping process works for both transparent and opaque words. Um, an irregular word may take longer to learn, but fortunately in English, although we have many irregular words, they're usually only off by one uh, phonemic element, like the word put or comb or island, only have one sound that is irregular in print. I'm always amazed as I have a first grader learning to read and how often he sounds a word out and it's slightly off and I'm not sure he's going to get the correct word, but then he does. He does use his oral vocabulary skills to match that to the correct word that it should be. So orthographic mapping requires, in addition to letter sound proficiency, something called phonemic proficiency, which I want to touch on just as it's a relatively new term uh, as something slightly different from phonological awareness that many of us have heard about, because that's conscious awareness of being able to identify, ma maybe manipulate phonemes. But proficiency, what we mean here is that it's instant access to the phonemic structure of words without conscious effort. So it, it just happens unconsciously and very quickly. So like if I were to tell you to say the word spill backwards, think about that, you would end up segmenting it, locating each phoneme, manipulating the sequence to be backwards, and then you blend it all back together and say lips. Children and adults who have phonemic proficiency are able to do all of that manipulation super fast in only one to two seconds. And I mention this again because children who struggle with word level reading, this is an area where we might see they have less phonemic proficiency. And the new Wyatt for Achievement test that we looked at some data at earlier really has the first norm reference test for phonemic proficiency to measure this important skill. So wrapping up on the formula for the simple view of reading. The second major component is linguistic comprehension. It has many elements that go into it. Of course, vocabulary skills, your understanding of syntax and grammar, your background knowledge. Um, I reference here a book that's really interesting about the importance of background knowledge and um, the research on that. It requires working memory, attention, inferencing, comprehension, monitoring as you're reading and your nonverbal visual spatial skills. So we've looked at some typical reading development. What does it look like with students who struggle with the decoding part of that equation? What is dyslexia? Well, first of all, and just in terms of some names, the word dyslexia is used often interchangeably with other terms like reading disability, reading disorder, learning disability and reading, and so forth. And it really seems to vary depending on what state you live in, what kind of definitions are used in that location. And sometimes educators in schools may use both the term dyslexia and learning disability and reading. I've talked to people in other states where they say, no, only physicians use the word dyslexia in schools. We always say uh, it's a reading disorder or something else. So lots of interchangeability between these terms, but the disorder we're trying to describe is the same uh, across the, the different naming conventions. And these are students with poor decoding skills. 
Historically, it dates all the way back to the 19th century with an ophthalmologist in 1887 that first used the term dyslexia. So there's an early idea that was somehow related to the visual processing system, that there was something visual going on when a, a, a person couldn't properly decode printed text. Over the years, we've come to understand that it's not a visual problem as much as a language process. Um, and for a while, there was interventions done, process training of visual perceptual and visual motor skills to, with the idea that that was going to help these um, children and adults improve their reading skills, but really didn't improve overall reading. It, visual training can help improve tracking skills, but it didn't help with the decoding or reading. So as time has evolved and more research, we understand dyslexia is language-based. Sometimes you'll still find a public perception that it's a visual problem or you need to take your child to an eye doctor uh, when the topic of dyslexia comes up. But in education and psychology research, we know it is a language-based disorder. So, and there have been some studies to try to um, correct some of the early myths about dyslexia, like that it was, it's simply reversals in writing. There's a lot of jokes, uh, especially, you know, late night comedians, they're always telling jokes about dyslexia and it all has to do with getting your letters mixed up in a word or seeing things backwards. But um, Valentino did a study where he had dyslexic and non-dyslexic students reproduce Hebrew letters that they hadn't seen before. And the students with dyslexia were able to um, reproduce them just as accurately. Um, so it was a piece of evidence that it's not just a visual problem or reversing of things in writing. Sometimes there's also an idea that if you reverse letters and numbers, that must mean you have dyslexia. What we know is actually developmentally appropriate for children to reverse letters and numbers through early grades, especially certain letters and numbers like your B's and D's and P's and Q's and things like that. If it doesn't go away within a few years of handwriting instruction, it could be an indicator that maybe you need some further investigation to the area of dyslexia. It definitely doesn't mean a child has dyslexia even at that point, um, but might be an indicator for, to evaluate further. So in 2002, the International Dyslexia Association put out a definition, and I know that um, many state handbooks of dyslexia do somewhat mirror or align with this definition, but they described it as a specific learning disability. So getting back to that slide about dis the term dyslexia being synonymous with learning disability, and secondly, that it's neurological in origin. So this is a brain-based disorder. Then they said what is characterized by is accurate or fluent word recognition, poor spelling, and poor decoding abilities. So that are the core symptoms that we would see. Now, those difficulties, what the research points to, there may be multiple causative factors, but the primary one that pervades across is a deficit in the phonological component of language. So this is where we're seeing the an underlying cause, again, not visual, but here in our language system, in our phonological system. So a child's development in phonological skills is unexpected in relation to their other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. And these difficulties can have some secondary consequences of impacting reading comprehension. So as we were looking at our examples of the simple view of reading, if you are having trouble decoding the individual words or you're doing it very slowly, that can then interfere with your ability to understand what you've read. Then if you have trouble decoding and with reading comprehension, children start to avoid or reduce their reading experience. And you know that after the first couple of grades of elementary school, our reading is how we really increase our vocabulary skills as well as our background knowledge in different subject areas. 
So there, there are long-term secondary consequences from this primary decoding or word level reading challenge. One other definition I wanna to touch on came from the Senate in 2015. Uh, and they said it was an unexpected difficulty in reading for an individual who has the intelligence to be a much better reader and that it's due to a difficulty getting to the individual sounds of spoken language, which affects the ability to speak, read, spell, and often to learn another language. And then that became the First Step Act, a bill signed into law in 2018. So the deficit responsible for dyslexia, uh, as I've been talking about, resides in the language system. And particularly, if we think about different components of language here, it's in the phonologic module. So up at the top, you can see what do we need for reading? Our two um, components that we can decode the words and we have the language comprehension. And if you have dyslexia, in, within your language system, this phonology component being a weakness then blocks your decoding and that um, affects your ability to apply your higher level skills to identify a word's meaning and that's going to affect your overall reading comprehension skills. So here's an example of, of what we see, what the discrepancy looks like in skills for someone with dyslexia. Amy has having difficulty reading the word volcano. She's going, I can't do it. When she's shown a picture of a volcano, she retrieves tornado, a word that sounds similar. And her teacher says, what, do you know what a volcano is? And she explains, it's a big mountain with a hole on top and smoke comes out and hot lava and so forth. So she knows exactly what the word means but wasn't able to identify in print. So that's that disconnect between someone's language, oral language skills, intelligence, and then this decoding at the word level. And from Dr. Sally Shaywitz, we have research on the imaging, the pathways involved in reading. So the neural pathways have been identified as these three parts of the brain. For vocalization and articulation, your inferior frontal gyrus. For word analysis, the parietotemporal area. And for word recognition and automaticity, the occipitotemporal area. So all three of these working together um, are involved in proficient reading. Then she did studies looking at brain images for people who had been diagnosed with dyslexia and they showed a different picture. So on the left side, we have a typical reader and on the right, someone identified with dyslexia. So in the people with dyslexia, the two posterior systems at the back of the brain were functioning inefficiently or underactivated. So this is part of that support for the idea that this is neurological uh, brain-based in its origin. When you want to evaluate and understand dyslexia, it's helpful to have a, a diagnostic model of what different components you're going to look at. So we're gonna review that next. First, we're gonna take our formula, our simple view of reading, and see what if one of those areas is relatively weak. So first of all, if you are have strong decoding skills and, and good oral language skills, you're, you're gonna be in the typical reader category. The students who have weak word level decoding skills, but good language is this area we're focusing on today of a specific reading disability or dyslexia. We also have 
students who might be strong with decoding, but weak in their language comprehension. Uh, sometimes that's called hyperlexia. And then uh, students who are weak in both decoding and language comprehension are more of just a uh, garden variety overall weak in their reading skills. So here we're looking at a research supported model for conceptualizing dyslexia that looks at multiple sources of information and the degree to which a student has already responded to intervention instruction. It is important to incorporate all this information from different sources as well as the historical information as we're looking at uh, an identification of dyslexia. At school, the commonly observed task of reading and writing is when we start to see the symptoms of dyslexia. So before even the instruction on learning to read, children with dyslexia may have difficulties with alphabet writing, letter identification, and or phonics, or being able to link the letters and the sounds. After exposure to reading, then they may have difficulty decoding pseudo words, word reading, reading fluency, spelling, and written expression. Also, it's common to see as we're um, looking at skills that a student with dyslexia may have reading comprehension scores or performance significantly lower than their listening comprehension skills. So we would want to collect information about educational history, any accommodations they've received, and sometimes even areas beyond these primary symptoms might be evaluated as well, like vocabulary and grammar skills, um, to look at their overall oral and written language skills. Next, we want to, as part of our assessment model, look at causes and correlates of dyslexia, not just the symptoms, but the, the factors that may be contributing to the decoding challenges. So we might assess phonological processing, rapid automatic naming, and auditory verbal working memory. Also, many times we look at processing speed, associative memory, long-term storage and retrieval, and orthographic processing. So the first three in the purple boxes are really identified as paramount for a dyslexia evaluation according to IDA. And even though phonological processing is that key factor, there are often other kind of deficits that contribute or help explain the profile of someone with dyslexia. After the cause of correlates, we might wanna look at risk factors. So there is a high family history component, as well as there's often a history of early language impairment or poor receptive vocabulary. And we may wanna look at relative strengths like fluid reasoning and problem solving, oral language skills is often a strength and many times math is a strength here. So key language areas for a dyslexia evaluation would be auditory working memory, receptive vocabulary, written expression, listening comprehension. I know in, in um, some state handbooks is listed as a secondary area, although in, in schools, it seems that's often almost always incorporated. Um, you might also look at reading comprehension for those secondary effects and grammatical ability. 
So the next few slides take this model of dyslexia evaluation and just show it in a table form with the skills and how you might lay it out as you were doing an analysis to see if scores were below average, average, above average, and is that an indicator of risk? And in the blue box here, we have the symptoms of difficulty that IDA recommends as key indicators. So you would wanna look at your symptoms, then your causes and correlates like phonological processing, rapid automatic naming, and auditory verbal working memory, in addition to possibly other causes. And then you also wanna look at your risk factors and potential strengths. This is a chart from the Wyatt Four uh, Achievement Test. And in that manual, we take a referral question like a child that might have word reading, reading comprehension challenges and recommend um, what subtest you might wanna give. So there's two core tests for individual word decoding as well as reading comprehension, but then each column tells you what you might wanna investigate further. So if reading comprehension came out as an area of concern, you might wanna also give the language test on the Wyatt Ford listening comprehension and oral expression, or do a more in-depth language evaluation. Then if fluency is a concern, there's several subtests that look at fluency at the word level and the passage level. For word recognition, we can go further in depth to phonemic proficiency tests I mentioned earlier, as well as two tests that look at orthographic skills, orthographic fluency, orthographic choice, and spelling. And then if decoding skills is an area of concern, there's two subtests to look at decoding. And then it lists some other areas you might want to assess as well that are not part of the Wyatt test battery, but could be drawn from other test batteries. So we've been talking about dyslexia, but it's important to understand um, that it, that's only one type of a reading disorder. There are other types of reading disorders. So we'll look at how that is organized. First, with some definitions, um, largely this is drawn from the research of Dr. Virginia Berenger, who had two very large grants and research studies from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And what she wanted to really understand was the component processes of normal written language, as well as written language disabilities. So she looked at phonology, how sounds or phonemes are organized and used to produce meaning. Then the second component is orthography, how sounds are represented by written or printed symbols or graphemes, and morphology, how words are formed or structured. So we have this triangle here, where if we look at just the top component, if you have challenges with the orthographic processing, difficulties remembering the spatial orientation and sequence of language symbols, that is often associated with dysgraphia. For students who had challenges with both orthographic and phonological skills that fit into the category of dyslexia. And then if you had orthographic phonological plus difficulty with your morphological skills, that is the third area, the oral and written language learning disability or OWL LD. So in this way, you can see that different combinations of challenges would suggest different subtypes of a reading disorder. Another way to look at that is across um, six subtypes of reading disorders. The first three actually fall under the umbrella of dyslexia. So we'll look at those a little bit more in depth. And then we have language, fluency, and comprehension. Dysgraphia or impaired letter production is a neurodevelopmental disorder that's manifest by illegible inefficient handwriting 
and results in deficits in, in graphomotor skills or in storing and retrieving the orthographic codes or the letter forms. So that can often co-occur with the other subtypes here, especially with dyslexia. For the first subtype or the phonological dyslexia, this is where your core deficit is your phonological skills and you can't use that as a route to decoding a word. So what these students do is frequently guess words based on the initial letter. They don't have a good phonological route, so they over rely on how a word looks on the visual and orthographic cues. Uh, sometimes they might read irregular words better than pseudo words because they're just using how a word looks. They have to memorize whole words because of their poor decoding strategy. And about two thirds of children with a reading disorder are dysphonetic readers of this subtype. They have difficulty processing information through the auditory challenges, but they might have other areas of strength like with their orthographic skills. The second subtype or orthographic dyslexia is a different route. So here we have difficulty using the visual lexical route to reading and writing words. It's sometimes called visual word form dyslexia or dysidetic dyslexia. Here you can sound out words, but you can't automatically and effortlessly recognize words in print. So these readers over rely on their phonetic skills. They have to read everything out letter by letter, sound by sound, and then they, they're they not as proficient as at the word recognition component. Their pseudo word reading is better actually than their irregular word reading. This is a smaller group, about 14% of students with dyslexia. And both of these subtypes, listing comprehension is typically stronger than reading comprehension. But the third subtype is the mixed. Uh, the most severe is that you have impairment in both routes to decoding words, both your phonological and your orthographic skills. So you don't really have a usable key to unlock the code of literacy. When you look at their oral reading skills, there's not even there's not a consistent pattern of errors. They have difficulty with all different types of words. But again, listening comprehension is generally stronger than reading comprehension. When we get to the fourth subtype, what we call language here, or it's called the OWL learning dis disability, then you have language skills being impaired as well. So poor listening and reading comprehension. For fluency, they may read accurately and decode words well, but their speed of reading is very slow. And often these students might also have a naming speed deficit when you look at rapid automatic naming tasks. And the last component is comprehension. Here, they are able to decode, but the, when asked questions to comprehend the text that they've read, they still um, they, they don't score well. They have difficulty with the comprehension aspect. With this, I will turn it back over to Gloria to talk about the role of the SLP. Okay. Thank you so much, Anise. All right. You hear me okay, Anise? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I was checking the chat box as we were going, and there are a number of questions about dyslexia and its relationship to specific reading disabilities, specific reading disorder. I think in the past, the term dyslexia was one that was used primarily in the diagnostic and statistical manual. And in schools, children with the same characteristics would be classified with a specific learning disability. And when we chose the areas um, 
of need, we would identify primarily basic reading. So a specific learning disability in basic reading, or like Anise said, a specific reading disability or a specific reading disorder. In terms of characteristics, you're thinking about the same child, whether we determine that the 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 eligibility is going to be using the term dyslexia or specific reading disability. Now, in recent years, what we have found, especially with the Cassidy Mikulski, the First Step Act that was published um, a few years ago, the term dyslexia is being used more frequently in school settings. But effectively, whether we use the term dyslexia or a specific reading disability or specific learning disability in reading, effectively, we're talking about a student who is struggling with reading specifically because of a weakness in decoding. So think about the simple view of reading where reading comprehension is the product of decoding and linguistic comprehension. The child who might be classified with dyslexia or a specific reading disorder would be one who is struggling with reading, with reading comprehension, primarily because of a weakness in decoding. Now, let's be clear. If a child is in grade five, for example, where the focus of the curriculum is comprehension, the child is going to be struggling with comprehension because as we know, decoding is an important component of comprehension. So it doesn't matter if linguistic comprehension is 100, say, if decoding is zero, zero times 100 is going to be zero for reading comprehension, right? So a child in fifth grade could be struggling with reading comprehension, which would be the demands of the curriculum, but the child is struggling with comprehension as a result of the weaknesses in decoding. So often we would say that reading comprehension weaknesses are secondary to the weaknesses in decoding. And that's what you're thinking about when you think about dyslexia. There were also a number of questions that talked about the assessment for dyslexia and the role of the speech language pathologist. And so we want to spend some time thinking through the role of the speech language pathologist, because really, when you think about the assessment, there are so many different key areas that we need to assess. And one of those key areas, we certainly talked about the written language when Anise showed that hybrid model for dyslexia identification. Certainly, the written language component is effective, is, is important, thinking about word identification, thinking about phonological decoding, thinking about reading comprehension. But an important component of a dyslexia evaluation is language. So we talked about language and we talked about the phonology, the morphology, the syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. And often what tends to happen, especially in schools, is that the referral for a language evaluation more often than not will precede the referral for a dyslexia evaluation. So often what I have found in working in schools as a school psychologist is that more often than not, I would be collaborating with the speech language pathologist because when I get the referral because of, because of academic concerns, the SLP already has assessed language. And so let's say that you had used the cell five maybe to assess language, to identify whether or not the child had a language disorder and maybe to be able to specify the nature of that disorder, which are the purposes uh, for the cell five. Well, from your cell five evaluation, you have information about phonological memory using the recalling sentences subtest. You have information about receptive vocabulary. There are three 
three different tests, depending on the age of the student with whom you're working, linguistic concepts, word classes, and word definitions. They'll provide us with information about receptive vocabulary. What about information on structured writing? The, that would provide us with information on written expression. And then for listening comprehension, several cell five tests will provide information about listening comprehension, following direction, semantic relationships, sentence comprehension, understanding spoken paragraphs. And then cell five also includes a reading comprehension component. And then what about grammatical ability, formulated sentences, recalling sentences, sentence assembly and word structure. So why would I, as the school psychologist, I can certainly do that, right? But, but there is no need for me to assess language when I can collaborate with my um, colleague down the hall who already has this information that will allow us to describe some of these key language areas that we know are important for a dyslexia evaluation. So again, when you think about about these components, think about how we can work together most effectively and collaborate to make sure that we get what we need if we have to go to the IEP team or whatever that team is called at your school that'll determine eligibility. How can we make sure that we have all of that information that we need without necessarily duplicating efforts, right? Because I think that's the most important thing. So one of the things that the S SLP does um, routinely is really um, assessing language competence. I always think about schools as places where children go to develop competence, whether you're thinking about behavioral competence, you're thinking about academic competence, social competence. In this case, we want to talk about language competence. And so it might be that you have information for, um, for a child, maybe a child whose age is seven years, eight months at the time of the evaluation. And we want to see whether or not we need to provide some support, maybe some early intervening services for language. And so we administer, let's say, the cell five. You look at the core language score, the standard score of 84 which, as you know, if you're familiar with the cell five, would describe her overall language as within the below average range. And then you could look at the tests that contribute to that core language index, and you could see that the scale scores mean of 10 standard deviation three. You could see that those those scale scores range from a high of 10 for word structure and formulated sentences to a low of one for sentence comprehension. And you're probably already starting to think, I wonder what, what differentiates sentence comprehension from these other three subtests. And then you want to drill down to try to unpack these scores a little bit, because it does seem like maybe there are there is a pattern of strengths and weaknesses that will allow us to think through how we can best proceed to allow this child to develop language competence. And then when you look at all of the subtests that assess language receptively compared to those that assess language expressively, you see that the standard score for receptive language, um, 63, again, mean is 100, standard deviation, 15, 63 is more than two standard deviations below the mean, right at the first percentile. And then when you look at expressive language, you notice that her standard score for expressive language falls within the average range. So it seems like a significant difference between receptive and expressive language, 33 point difference in fact, which indicates that her expressive language is better developed or or she responds she responds more effectively to if you think about word structure and formulate formulated sentences and recalling sentences, what those tests measure, like you think about grammar, you think about formulated sentences and word structure, looking at grammar, recalling sentences would be that 
phonological memory. So again, noting here that receptive appears to be an area of need. And you could unpack it even further, looking at content, semantics, and structure, which would be the syntax piece. And when you look at language content, her standard score of 74 um, does seem to indicate that she is struggling, especially when you look at the scale score column, especially with word classes. And then under language structure, again, the sentence comprehension that we saw earlier certainly is an area of weakness. So you'd consider all of this information and you would conclude that she has more difficulties with receptive language and with the content of language and that she might in fact benefit from structured language tasks um, to address her weakness in the area of receptive language and that maybe we would need to write some goals and objectives to target her um, increasing, to increase her knowledge of word meanings, word associations, and then also to increase her comprehension of sentences, especially sentences that increase in length and complexity. So again, you could see how you would unpack this information um, even before you get to the dyslexia, um, dyslexia evaluation. But certainly some of the information here can contribute to that dyslexia evaluation as well. Another component um, that is important and that Anise talked about is semantics, right? Word meanings. So when you think about assessing vocabulary, certainly um, it's important for us to understand if a child is struggling with reading comprehension, is it the linguistic comprehension? Does the child have a, an age-appropriate vocabulary? And sometimes um, children would have a vocabulary that they express more effectively um, when the, the output demand is receptive, where you need to show me that you know the meaning of the word versus expressive, where you need to tell me the meaning of the word. So here, for example, the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test certainly would be an, an example um, of a test that you could use to assess receptive vocabulary. And the standard score of 101 would um, suggest that the, the understanding or comprehension or listening vocabulary is within the expected range. Now, this doesn't tell me anything about speaking vocabulary. And there was a question about articulation. Sometimes um, it, it, when, when children struggle with um, speech, when children have a speech sound disorder, it sometimes can conf confound our assessment of language, especially if the tasks require an expressive demand. It might appear that language is not developing as expected. Um, so for that reason, a tool like, like the PPVT-5, where the child simply has to point, that would be something that would be effective when children are struggling with speech sound or the production of, of, of sounds, and it's hard for us to understand their language. So maybe we change the output demand to pointing or showing, for example. And then, of course, I also want to mention the self preschool um, because I think it's important for us to identify as early as we can um, children who are struggling with oral language. We understand the, the impact of oral language. Um, it's important for children to be ready for literacy, and they're ready for literacy, as we talked about, when they have an ear for sounds, that phonemic awareness. So the Self Preschool 3 um, provides um, much of the same information that the Self 5 does, certainly a score for overall language, a score for receptive language and for expressive language, for language content and language structure. But one of the things I think that it adds for us is the early literacy index that you could see down here at the bottom is composed of 
um, the subtest phonological awareness, and then the pre-literacy rating scale. And then also the academic language readiness index um, that's made up of expressive vocabulary, following directions, and the descriptive pragmatics profile. So again, the earlier we can identify needs in oral language, the more effective our interventions are likely to be. And of course, we also have to reference the, um, the preschool language scale, right? That'll provide you with information also on receptive and expressive language. So there was a question about about ability and when you're thinking about dyslexia and cognitive ability. Here I have these scores, a standard score of 70 for auditory comprehension, 67 for expressive communication. And if you look at the graphic profile, it's clear that the performance of this child is significantly below the mean score of 100, right? 70 is two standard deviations below the mean, um, equal to or better than the scores of about 2% of others the same age. So clearly, this would be an example of a child who would be struggling with language. Now, it's really important for me, if I'm the SLP, to make sure that I provide interventions for language but it's also important for me to refer for comprehensive psychoeducational evaluation because I need to understand the impact of these relatively low scores on, on performance in the classroom, right? Now, so the role of the SLP in assessment or in the identification, I think, again, dyslexia really has that significant language component. But just as important as your role as an SLP in identification is your role in intervention. So we want to think about some of the things that we might be able to do. And a lot of this goes back to the information provided by Asha in 2001, um, where Asha described the connection between oral and written language. So I think the SLP, again, um, we learn language first by ear and then by mouth. So oral language, if you will, really is the foundation for written language, for reading and writing. So entering pre-kindergarten or kindergarten with good, um, with good language by, by ear and language by mouth um, really sets the child up for that literacy, making the connection between language and literacy. So, so Asha talks about um, several realities that oral language provides the foundation for the development of reading and writing. And so as speech language pathologists and other educators, other professionals working in schools, we want to make sure that we understand if their oral language is developing as expected. Here is the other reality. The relationship between oral language and literacy, reading and writing is reciprocal in nature. And those interconnections originate in early childhood. So we want to make sure that as early as we possibly can, we identify any weaknesses in order to be able to intervene as early as possible. So Asha talks about, about how we help children develop language competence and talks about um, the, the connections between oral language um, difficulties and written language difficulties. So children with speech and language impairments are at increased risk for difficulties with early literacy development, with conventional literacy development. What does that mean? It means that if we provide intervention for oral language, we can positively influence literacy development. And if we provide intervention for literacy development, we can positively influence oral language. Again, that reciprocal relationship. And then also when you think about children with spoken language difficulties, they also frequently have difficulty learning to read and write. 
Similarly, children with reading and writing problems frequently have difficulties with spoken language. What does that mean in terms of instruction and intervention? Instruction in spoken language can produce growth in written language and instruction in written language can result in growth in spoken language. I always think about vocabulary growth, for example, so that it's really important. I, I hear words spoken around me, especially little ones. When, when, when they are starting um, to pay attention in their environments, most of the words that they're picking up, that they're going to be using, they are picking up in their home environment. They're picking up through interactions with other people, which is why that study by Betty Hart and Todd Risley was so informative, because what it tells you is that children's vocabulary sizes will mirror the vocabulary sizes of the adults um, with whom they interact consistently. So interactions, those verbal interactions are important. In addition, and once you start reading, not only do you expand your vocabulary by interact by through verbal interactions, you also expand your vocabulary by reading. There are so many words that we never that we never encounter in in speaking, right? That we encounter only in reading. So it's really important for us to make sure that children will be excited about reading because that is a, an important way for them to continue to develop their vocabulary. So SLPs have an important role to play um, in providing direct services. When you think about language competence, we have here in Asha talks about developing language competence for students with communication disorders. And that is certainly important. Um, I think also developing language competence for, for, for all students and doing so by collaborating with, with teachers. So, so a lot of many SLPs work collaboratively with teachers. They contribute to literacy efforts of the school district for all students, and they use their knowledge of oral language um, as they are collaborating with, with, with teachers. So there are certain um, things that I want to just draw your attention to, and these are things that you can investigate um, later. But Dr. Lance Gentile, who's the author of the Oracy Instructional Curriculum, um, talks a lot about the importance of providing instruction in oral language. He talks about the fact that schools typically tend to offer an explicit curriculum for developing reading skills and writing skills. But his contention is that instruction in reading or in writing alone is not enough to equalize the language gaps of many children struggling to acquire language. So you're thinking not only of children who, who speak English and who come to school um, having mastered fewer words than many of their, their same age peers, but you're also thinking about children who might be learning English as a second language, right? So how can we, we ensure that we are equalizing those language gaps? What Dr. Um, Gentile um, suggests is that we, in addition to that explicit curriculum in reading and writing, that we also offer an explicit curriculum for oral language discourse, and learning behavior, a curriculum that will create a direct connection between language and literacy development. So when you think about this ORACY instructional, um, the ORACY instructional curriculum, um, effectively what you're doing is you're talking and you want the child to um, learn language through those powerful professional student interactions. So he talks about three types of talk, regardless of the activity that you're using, maybe you're looking at reading or writing or listening or creative arts. Effectively, you want to use linguistic talk. You want to focus, you want to talk about the words, you want to talk about the relationships among the words, you want to help children to develop vocabulary. 
You also want to focus on contextualized talk, where you're talking about the here and now, um, what is known about what it is we're focusing. So during reading, for example, talk during the reading when it's appropriate, because what you're trying to do is to deepen students' understanding of the background knowledge, the experiences, maybe um, phrases and quotations. That's where we often are able to focus on the idioms. It's raining cats and dogs, and I see neither cat nor dog. So again, you're thinking about that within the context of whatever it is you're reading. How can you help children expand um, their vocabulary? And then decontextualized talk, thinking about after the activity is completed, talking in detail about the subject and use abstract vocabulary and concepts to, to discuss knowledge and ideas in a logical sequence. So again, being really purposeful and intentional when we think about helping um, children to develop their oral language skills. So we have a, a sample lesson and it's on our website. You can go there and find it. And effectively, this one is called the human sentence and the, his, the curriculum includes a number of other lessons. But for example, you might have your students in a class, you ask them to choose a topic or an object that they would like to talk about. Then you give the selected object to one student and you say, you can be the first part of our sentence. You will be, and let's say the subject is going to be a monkey, um, you will be the, the monkey. And then you ask, what does a monkey do? Again, those W questions, right? What does a monkey do? And maybe um, one of the answers is eats bananas. And then you proceed. When do monkeys eat bananas, right? Um, they eat bananas in the morning. Why do monkeys eat bananas in the morning, right? Because they're hungry, right? Okay. And then you're going to have each person who answered the question is going to stand in a line and I'm going to say my part of the sentence. Um, so the monkey, the monkey eats bananas and then somebody else in the morning because he hungry, he's hungry. So again, you could see you have a, a sentence that is syntactically correct, that is grammatically correct. The monkey eats bananas in the morning because it's hungry. And then maybe I can um, line up the children differently um, so that the sentence is not grammatically correct. There are so many different um, adaptations to show a sentence that is grammatically correct versus one that is that isn't. I can ask them to write the sentence in their notes in their notebooks. So again, you think about how you are effectively getting them to use language and how they are putting words together um, in a um, meaningful way, in a grammatically correct way. And then you might have some shared interaction where you can transform the sentence by turning it into a negative, a question, a command. So again, this would be like shifting intonation, thinking about prosody. So again, think about how we can incorporate ideas like this when we're teaching oral language. I think another activity, and I know you probably think about when you think about letters, the mental orthographic image. Um, we often talk about orthographic knowledge, but also um, as, as speech language pathologists, I think in, in school psychology, we talk more about the orthography or the visual representation. Speech language pathologists may refer more to mental orthographic images, but effectively when we think about reading and writing and spelling, as we mentioned, it all uses, all three use the oral language as the foundation. So this program, Spellings, uses a speech to print 
word study approach. And effectively what it does is it leverages the brain's innate biological wiring for oral language. So the students will first learn how to attend to the sound structure of spoken English words. And then they learn how to connect and combine sounds, how to connect and combine sounds and letter patterns, as well as meanings. And then they use all of that information to spell words. So I always think about reading and writing as having two different parts, right? So if I'm writing, if you ask me to spell a word and I can immediately retrieve from long-term memory the mental orthographic image, then I'm going to write it. And the ability to do that is really important when you think about so many words in the English language that sound differently than they look. Like, for example, um, Anise mentioned island, for example. If I were to use phonological awareness, phonological decoding, I may say is land. But if I can retrieve the mental orthographic image, or if you ask me to write it, I learned, maybe I might write E-Y-E -E land. That's, that's island, right? But it doesn't look right. That's not the correct mental orthographic image. Now, phonological awareness is important with spelling as well. And phonological awareness works really well if I have to write words that have highly predictable patterns, right? So you think about those words that, that like pseudo words, those are words often that have those highly predictable patterns. Let's say you tell me to write a word and I really don't know what it looks like. I can listen to the sounds and I can associate a symbol with each of those sounds and then I may get it right. And I probably will get it right if it's a word with highly predictable patterns like bad or bed or bid, right? I can get those right. But for some other words like maybe... Um, Kaylee, that that um, special dance that we do in Ireland, if you ask me to write that, I can never spell that correctly unless I can retrieve its mental orthographic image from my long-term memory. So effectively, what we're doing here is we're really thinking about integrating the orthographic, the phonological and the semantic. So when you think about the meaning codes, and when Anis showed you that those three circles, Dr. Berninger's work, you think about meaning codes coming from word knowledge and coming from morphological awareness, right? So, so I can, I, ultimately, reading comprehension depends on my ability to see a word, to say it right away, to know its meaning, and to do so effortlessly, right? That's, that's reading fluency. And spellings really pulls those pieces together for us. Okay. Okay, let's see here what is going on. Okay. I think maybe I got a little... Hold on one second. Okay. The other thing that I think might be helpful for you as you think about, about the role of the speech language pathologist when you think about intervention is providing direct explicit instruction in vocabulary. And Dr. Judy Montgomery's um, work on the bridge of vocabulary um, really, I think, is helpful when you think about lessons that would focus specifically on the development of vocabulary. And Dr. Um, Montgomery uses a list of top 10 strategies to teach um, vocabulary skills. And again, this is something you can find on our website, thinking about focusing on four types of vocabulary. So I think the research is clear that when you think about listening vocabulary, 
speaking vocabulary, reading and writing vocabulary, that those are distinctly different and require teaching using different methods. So that's one evidence-based strategy for teaching vocabulary. And then um, Dr. Montgomery talked, talks about tier two words. And if you're familiar with PPVT and EVT, you know that we talk a lot about the, um, about those, about different tiers of words. Okay, different tiers of words where we want to focus on tier two words. And those would be, all right, you hearing me okay, Sherry? Okay. All right, I think I'm getting some feedback here. Those would yes, be high frequency. Okay, thank you. Those would be high frequency words that are found in both oral and written discourse. Tier one words would be words that we typically learn even before we enter school. Um, so we want to make sure that we, we teach um, explicitly those high frequency words that we find in oral and written discourse. We also want to focus on repetition, right? There are some children who learn new words after one exposure, but I will tell you when we encounter those children, we remember them because we know that that is unusual. Most of us benefit from structured teaching, significant repetition, significant redundancy. So repetition is another important evidence-based strategy. And then Dr. Montgomery talks about um, dense neighborhoods. Words that are part of dense neighborhoods are words that um, are similar either phonologically, like pit and pet and pat and so on, or they might be similar semantically, like maybe I have a word web about playgrounds, um, and I think about all of the things that I'm likely to encounter in a playground, or they might be similar in terms of usage, maybe all using prepositions. And then a fifth one would be expanding concepts, teaching new concepts and the words that represent those ideas. And then some of the other one, introducing words in a highly organized manner to build powerful semantic fields, um, word consciousness, helping students develop awareness of words, interest in words and their meanings, levels of knowing, move from words that are unknown, try to get them over to an acquainted um, bucket, and then words with which the child is acquainted, try to get those to the level of established, and then focusing on word meanings, teach word meanings, and then what words mean when used together. So for example, I remember this high school student one time um, was telling me that um, she was afraid she was going to get a poor grade in this class because she got a, a low grade on an assignment. So I said to her, well, maybe you want to ask your teacher tomorrow if he's planning to drop the lowest grade because many teachers will drop the lowest grade toward the end of the semester. So when I saw her later, I said, well, did you ask, is he going to drop the lowest grade? And she said, she started to smile. And I said, well, what? And she said, well, I didn't actually ask him if he was going to drop the lowest grade. I asked him if he was planning to expunge the lowest grade. Expunge was one of the words that the teacher had introduced the day before. And I said, well, what did he say? Did he say, yes, I'm going to drop it? And she's like, no, but he kind of smiled. And I said, just for using that word, he should have dropped it, but okay. So you want to make sure that you teach word meanings and then what words mean when they're used together. And then use spoken vocabulary instead of reading vocabulary. You know, dictionary definitions are are really important. And I would often say to somebody who will ask me the meaning of a word, I'd say, oh, go look it up. Um, but the truth is that dictionary definitions are re really not that effective when we're teaching vocabulary because they really, their definitions really focus on, on complexity, right? And we want to make sure that children understand. And then if you're focused on the three-tier model of vocabulary instruction, you could certainly get some information on that from PPVT as well as EVT. So if you look at the percent correct column here, you could see 
that this student for tier two um, performed slightly better on the receptive component, PPVT, compared to the EVT. And then for tier three words, um, certainly, um, again, seemed to struggle with tier three words. So again, that would tell us that we probably want to focus on helping the student develop a more robust um, mental dictionary for her age and that she might benefit from direct instruction on uh, to expand her vocabulary of tier two words. And then of course, PPVT and EVT also talk a lot about the breadth and depth of vocabulary. So when you think about the breadth of vocabulary, um, what, what's the number of words that the, the child knows? You're thinking about um, word families, um, because researchers assume that if speakers know one word in a family, like drive, um, the child would also know other words derived from that base word. So like drives, driving, driver, and so on. But we also want to focus on depth of vocabulary, right? So think about um, depth. Um, do you know the sound of the phonemes in the word? Can you spell the word? What about its morphological structure? What about the types of sentences in which you would use that word? And what about multiple meanings of the word? With, with which other words might this word be associated? And then pragmatically, what are the situations in which use of that word would be appropriate? So again, you always want to think about um, expanding breadth as well as depth of vocabulary. And you can use different things like in this case, morphemic analysis, thinking about one word. And again, what are some um, words that are derived from the word great, greater, greatest, greatly, great hearted, and so on. Same thing, I mentioned the drive, driver, driving, driven. Again, um, again, think about these word webs as being really good visual representations in this example of word families, but also semantic relationships, right? Um, so if you think about like airports, I talked earlier about playgrounds, airports, what, what are some things that you would associate in a meaningful way with an airport? Maybe there are different gates, maybe there are passengers, maybe there are airplanes, maybe there are jets. And again, thinking about how you could use a semantic word web in order to focus on some of this. And then how can you consider um, maybe rule out language differences? Maybe um, I shouldn't be concerned about a language disorder. Maybe this child is learning English as a second language and has yet to develop the cognitive academic language proficiency that we know is important for formal academic learning. So again, make sure that we rule out any language difference. And then how you might use assessment data to identify treatment goals. I think I showed you this information before um, from the cell five, where receptive language score of 63 compared to the expressive language index of 96. And effectively, what you're looking for is to see that the difference between those two is it a true difference, meaning that it's not an artifact of the measurement error that's part of the standardized test? It is a significant difference. And then what is the prevalence in the normative sample? Um, what is the frequency of such a difference in terms of magnitude and in terms of direction? If it occurs in um, less than 10% of our normative sample, it's something that we should address when we are planning our treatment goals. And similarly here, and I want to show you this one because I realize um, I have a little um, error right here. So like you can also compare receptive language with expressive language. Let's say your score on PPVT was 101, on um, EVT was a standard score of 80. The difference between the two, 21 points. So 
21 points, is that different significant statistically? Yes, it exceeds our critical value of 7.78, and a difference of that magnitude is rare. So if you want to make that change on your handout, um, it should be 21. So again, you could see how you are combining your assessment data with your treatment goals, because assessment effectively will connect us to interventions. So. I'll go back out here in a second and see what um, questions are there. But in summary, the concepts that we want you to, um, to walk away with here would be that reading comprehension is the product of decoding and language comprehension. So if a student is struggling with language comprehension, it truly doesn't matter um, um, how well they decode, reading comprehension is going to be affected. If language comprehension is good and decoding is a weakness, again, that product will affect reading comprehension. Anything multiplied by that zero is going to be zero. Effectively, we want to make sure that linguistic or language comprehension is developing as expected. And when children enter kindergarten or pre-kindergarten and we're making that connection between language and literacy, we want to make sure that children have mastered those foundational language skills. We've included some references for you. If you have any questions, we have the link for you to um, use to submit your questions. But we also in included some resources for you, some a book by Dr. Virginia Berninger, um, who we referenced. We also referenced Dr. David Kilpatrick and certainly Dr. Sally Shaywitz as well. And then we have some additional references and resources toward the end of the presentation for you. Okay, so let's see if there are any questions that we might be able to answer before we um, conclude here today. Are there any questions okay, that we can present live? I just mentioned as you're looking at that, that several people have asked about the a handout of the slides, which is available under in, in this webinar under the okay. handouts where, okay where they find it sherry <laughs> confirm and it's under event resources thank you <laughs> yeah right under event, event resources. resources and yeah. then um it is recorded um, and you can watch the recording if you had an issue i know a lot of states having power outages and connection issues, um, uh, you can log in again afterward to watch the recording. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I'm going to um, just ask this one question. I think we have time. Can you please speak to the connection between IQ and reading disorders? Many have recently challenged its relevance. And I think in terms of, of ability to learn, um, certainly if you're thinking about the IDEA definitions, and of course it's gonna depend on how you how your state determines eligibility under the classification specific learning disability. If you're using an ability achievement discrepancy model, certainly the IQ is important. If you're using patterns of strengths and weaknesses analysis, it's important there as well. If you're using um, RTI or response to um, intervention, certainly um, it's, it's not necessary there. Let me tell you what I think about ability. So I think ability is important, but what I think is truly important is ability to learn. If I think about the federal definition of a specific learning disability in reading, it's going to mean, according to Cassidy and Mikulski, it's going to mean that my scores on reading are unexpected in relation to my ability. So if my ability is right within the average range and my scores for reading are in the low 70s, then those scores are unexpected. But here is where you can also find information on unexpected. I sometimes would administer an achievement test first because what I want to see is 
am I going to see a pattern of strengths and weaknesses in achievement? Is math significantly higher than reading? Well, that tells me right away that this student is capable of learning, right? He's learning in math, which means that I now need to try to identify those reading-related factors that would explain the unexpected scores in reading. So even though I have yet to administer a measure of ability, I already have indications that this student is capable of learning. And there is probably something that is required for reading that may be not um, as developed as it should be that is interfering with, um, with reading. So there are a few other questions that were in the chat box. We'll address those offline. We'll email a response to you. But we want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we appreciate all your feedback. We hope that you find the information useful. And we hope that you'll join us in the future um, when we present webinars on other topics. So enjoy the rest of your day, everybody.